Good morning, Crossview, and welcome to worship. We've continued to work through all of the logistical details of coming back to Crossview live and in person. And we are planning to be back live on May 31st, two weeks from now. So continue to pray. Continue to pray that God would give us wisdom and discernment. Continue to pray that God would find a, give us a solution to this health crisis that we have in Georgia, in Marietta, and the United States. We serve a mighty God, and our purpose today is to come before him and praise him and lift up his name in praise and with thanksgiving for all the blessings that he gives us. And he is the king of our heart. the king of my heart be the shadow where i hide the ransom for my life oh he is my song you are good you're good oh you are good you're good oh you are good. the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails the anchor in my waves oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins the echo of my days oh he is my song and let the king
I know as we've all gone through these past two months, there have been times of worrying and times of stress and times of anxiousness. But God, those two words, but God. And like me, I'm sure that you, you worried and you stressed. And yet, like me, I'm sure you've seen how God has been with you. Just like I have, you felt that same spirit of the Lord building up in you, giving you confidence. And I hope that we've all received one thing. Probably we've all learned many things, but this one thing is to trust in him, the one who already has won the victory. So if we put our whole life in his hands and our whole heart just simply to trust him, that he knows what's best, that's what he wants us to do. That's the place he wanted us to be. And Isaiah 26, verses 3 and 4, just confirms that it says, You will keep in perfect peace the mind that is, in, that is dependent on you, for it is trusting in you. Trust in the Lord forever, because in Yahweh, the Lord is an everlasting rock. Letting go of every single dream, I lay each one down at your feet. Every moment of my wandering never changes what you see. I've tried to win this war, I confess. My hands are I need your rest, mighty warrior, king of the fight. No matter what I face, you're by my side. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk.
song Though darkness fills the night It cannot hide the light Whom shall I fear? You crush the enemy Underneath my feet You are my sword and shield Though troubles linger still
Your love becomes my greatest defense. It leads me from the dry wilderness. All I did was praise. And all I did was worship. And all I did.
and you picked up all my pieces, put me back together. You are the defender of my heart. When I thought I lost me, you knew I had left me. You reintroduced me to your love, and you picked up all my pieces. And praise, Lord, for your presence today. Thank you, Lord God, that you are the defender of our heart. Thank you, Lord God, that you go before us, that you fight the battle for us, and the battle has already been won. We give you praise, Lord, for being a risen Savior, a soon coming King, and it's in your name we pray today. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Crossview family and all of those watching the service today online. We welcome you as we praise and worship the Lord together. A lot of times we have strong desires, but don't have the discipline to make those desires come true. I was never more than an average athlete in school, but when I started going to college, I knew that I would have to do my own thing if I wanted to stay physically fit. And so I began to exercise. And it was funny because there would come times when I wouldn't feel like doing it and I would let lapses come and the result was never good. And so I would get back to it again. And the analogy can be made for the same thing for successfully believing God. It depends on our desire to stay spiritually fit and our desire to be like Jesus. And we know he was perfect and pure and he trusted the Father completely. He gave all of himself in every way. So even more than just the desire to be like him, we must act. We must be willing to do what God calls us to do with no limits. Leviticus 11, 44 and 45 says, you must be holy because I am holy. And the word holy means set apart, unique, not like everyone else around us. Psalm 119, 32 is one of my favorite verses of all times. David is talking and he says, I run to the path of your commands because you have set my heart free. What a powerfully incredible statement that is. I, I'm interested in the fact and I take note of the fact that it says I run, not I jog, not I walk or crawl or stand still, or go the other direction, but I run to the path of your commands because you have set my heart free. Truly today, the only freedom that we have is knowing Jesus and following hard after what God commands. The lifestyle Jesus demonstrated so perfectly while he was here on earth. I willingly choose to run the path of your commands, David says, because you've set my heart free. All of my joy, all of my peace, all of my physical, relational, and spiritual blessings are the result of knowing Jesus. Therefore, I will run hard after all that he has commanded me to do. And I will engage him in word and in prayer to make sure that I'm following the Holy Spirit and not my spirit. We see that that entails giving everything. Paul knew that only too well. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, the very well-known verses that still are such a blessing. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. And don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Long before Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote these words, God was working in Gideon's life to make him that new person. 
Not only did Gideon submit to the will of God, but his commitment to the Lord was seen by others and used to change their lives, as well as bring, bringing freedom from the oppression of the Midianites. And so today, as we look at the next chapter in the life of Gideon, I'd like to take just a moment and recap last week. Due to their discontinued disobedience, God's people were living under the harsh and painful rule of the Midianites. Gideon was literally threshing wheat undercover, underground in the bottom of a wine press to hide it so the Midianites wouldn't steal it. And the angel of the Lord, who is none other than the incarnate Jesus Christ, came to Gideon with the powerful command. At first, Gideon protests that he's not equipped, and the angel insists that he will empower Gideon to accomplish the task. Gideon then brings an offering for the angel to use as a sign that he is the man God is calling. And the angel miraculously caused fire to come on the sacrifice. And Gideon completely embraced the mission that God had called him to. So that pretty well catches us up to what we're going to look at today. And the first principle, the first bullet point we have today is that God works in those who desire to follow and obey him. God works in those who desire to follow and obey him. Verses 25 through 27. That night, by the way, we're in Judges chapter 6. That night the Lord said to Gideon, Take the second bull from your father's herd, the one that is seven years old. Pull down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole standing beside it. Then build an altar to the Lord your God here on this hilltop sanctuary, laying the stones carefully. Sacrifice the bull as a burnt offering on the altar, using as fuel the word of the Asherah pole you cut down. So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord had commanded. But he did it at night because he was afraid of the other members of his father's household and the people of the town. Now the immediately activity of the mission that God has called him to begins, but some changes had to happen before God's actual rescue could be in play. You see, there would be no power of God as long as there was an altar to Baal on the property of his father. You cannot worship God if you're also giving worship to anything else. In Matthew 6, 24, Jesus said, No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. And while Jesus in these verses is primarily speaking about money or wealth, the principle is still the same. God will never take a back seat or play second fiddle to anything or anyone else in our lives. The command to destroy the altar of Baal was the first test for Gideon. Now in the Jewish household, the father ruled, and it was not healthy to do something that would undermine his authority. Destroying the altar that his father had erected could have been punishable by death. But to his credit, Gideon demonstrated unmistakably that his commitment was to Jehovah God, even if it meant doing, even if it meant doing something that would anger his father. Consider the commands that God gave to Gideon. Each one had the, prince, had the potential of bringing serious conflict between Gideon and his father, not to mention the other townspeople. First of all, he was to take a bull that didn't belong to him. It belonged to his father to use to tear down the altar, which the father and his friends had erected to worship Baal, and then to use that same bull as a sacrifice to worship Jehovah. Now, the act of tearing down the altar and demolishing was another thing. It was probably going to go against his father's will and create problems. And then the third one was tearing down the Asherah pole. Asherah was a pagan idol worshipped as a fertility goddess. And often when the, when the pagan people or the Israelites themselves worshipped her, it spawned lewd sexual behavior during the worship. So we're reminded in these verses that a call from God doesn't always look like what we thought it would. There was a, this was a huge undertaking for getting his men to do since they knew there would be a lot of fallout from everyone in the town. Yet, this wasn't even the end of Gideon's mission from the Lord, but only the beginning. When we answer the call to follow God with our lives, the mission always begins with the task that is challenging. However, as we obey him and learn to trust him more, the scope of our mission and the challenges to accomplish it grow. In case any believer thinks that God only calls the pastor, the elders, the deacons, the worship leader, 
the Sunday school teachers, to accomplish big things for him, we should be reminded in this story that Gideon was not a priest. The altar was not a tabernacle. The materials he would use had not been consecrated to be used by the spiritual leaders. Mark 12, 50, Jesus said, Whoever, anyone who does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. So Gideon did as the Lord commanded. What if others were asked about my spiritual commitment? How would they describe me? The reason Gideon was picked because he was one of the few that had not yet bowed his knee to worship Baal. It's hard to be on mission for God if I'm just like those I'm trying to win. The second point today, following God often brings a negative response. Following God often brings a negative response. Verses 28 through 30. Early the next morning, as the people of the town began to stir, someone discovered that the altar of Baal had been broken down and that the Asherah pole beside it had been cut down. In their place, a new altar had been built, and on it were the remains of the bull that had been sacrificed. The people said to each other, Who did this? And after asking around and making a careful search, they learned that it was Gideon, the son of Joash. Bring out your son, the men of the town demanded of Joash. He must die for destroying the altar of Baal and for cutting down the Asherah pole. Well, as we could probably expect, when Gideon's father and the town people found out what Gideon had done, they were enraged to the point of even wanting to kill him. It's interesting that given the predicament they found themselves in because of the Midianites, they still wanted to worship and believe in a false god and goddess. However, if we look closely at American society today, there are numerous idols that people have come to worship. One revealing test is, what do I give my life too. What are the most important things in my life? If it's not trusting and following hard after God, then I'm worshiping something or someone else. It really doesn't matter what I say, for truly actions do speak louder than words. Americans have allowed work, pleasure, status, sports, beauty, relationships, and many other things to take the place of God in their lives. We can't just go to church on Sunday, sing the songs, and then say amen is something the pastor says, and then live life with no connection or commitment to God's call and what he desires to accomplish in our lives. Often we want to have a commitment to the Lord. We just, we just want it to be on our terms. For example, missing church for a whole baseball season because the travel team plays on Sunday. God is looking for Christians who will take a stand for him and not compromise what he's told us to do. Look at how skewed the mindset of the Israelites had become toward God. They wanted to kill Gideon because he had torn down the altars of Baal and Asherah and erected an altar to Jehovah God who had been their salvation for generations. We as believers need to be constantly aware of and committed to the truth that anything and everything that, lure, that lures us to compromise our commitment to the Lord all those things are infinitely short-lived compared to the blessing of serving God here on earth and the incomprehensible blessing of eternity in heaven. We must always be mindful of the fact that our lives in this world are not to revolve around us or even our loved ones. God has called us to be on mission and our view of desirable things here on earth compared with our view of God's mission provides a clear picture of who or what we serve. Now, it wasn't long before this torn down altar was discovered and the people were mad and angry and hostile and they began an investigation. It wouldn't take them long to find out that it was Gideon. And they immediately demanded that Gideon be put to death. Compare that with Jesus' statement when he was being tempted by Satan and he said, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. So they had definitely lost their way. How skewed things get and we no longer have the Word of God as the basis for our decisions and our lifestyle. We've taken Bible reading and prayer out of the schools. Now prayer is outlawed at the beginning of sports contests and most high school graduation exercises. We're not supposed to talk to anyone at work or school about the Lord. We're not supposed to bring the Bible or anything related to Christianity to school. It's okay to bring things of other religions. Those have historical value, supposedly, as long as they're not Christian. We're not supposed to speak out about abortion or homosexuality. We want to create laws in this nation against speaking out against it because it's said to cause mental anguish 
like a hate crime if we say what God says it is. It's interesting what causes the mental anguish is disobeying God. We're not supposed to challenge believers when they compromise their commitment. Today, many spiritual believers are as wussy as Peter when he slinked in the shadows. Gideon has been politically incorrect, and now he faces the music. Point number three, God's presence and power never leaves those who obey him. Well, we need to take that one home. We need to take that to the bank, and we need to remember it with every encounter and every decision we have to make. God's presence and power never leaves those who obey him. We're about to get to the fun part now. Verses 31 and 32. But Joash shouted to the mob that confronted him. Here's Joash now, who had been worshiping Baal and Asher and so forth. He shouted to the mob that confronted him, Why are you defending Baal? Will you argue his case? Whoever pleads his case will be put to death by morning. If Baal truly is a god, let him defend himself and destroy the one who broke down his altar. From then on, Gideon was called Jerobel, which means let Baal defend himself because he broke down Baal's altar. I'll tell you something, folks. We can, we can depend on this every second of every day. God never will leave you as a believer to contend with the enemy by yourself. In Hebrews 13, 5, he says, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. And often he provides help from an unexpected source. Interesting, because Joash had been a Baal worshiper. And now, in just one few moments' time, he's standing up for Gideon. Gideon was his son, but in the Jewish culture, if a child of any age brought shame to the family or did something that the father disapproved of, even the father often most always was on board with whatever punishment was required. I think Joash's change in thinking was more than family ties. God was blessing Gideon in ways he couldn't even have imagined because Gideon had trusted God and followed hard after his command. Psalms 37, 3 and 4 says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. Because Gideon so strongly and faithfully obeyed the Lord, it had an effect on his dad. He was convicted of the sins he was committing, and God used Gideon to bring his dad back to the Lord. The wayward one saw the truth and repented. In Isaiah, the Bible tells us that the word will not return void. So Joash stood with Gideon, not just as the father, but as a God follower. Every test, every call, every day, God has designed our lives to move us closer to being like Jesus. When I obey him in all things, I pass the test, and that behavior enables me to move to the next level. Not just to be used for God's glory, but to experience the joy, the power, and the peace that he plans for us. The greatest blessing a Christian can truly ever experience. When I live life my way, I rob myself of the fullness of God's blessing. I become a detriment to unbelievers, a lack of encouragement to other believers and live life wondering why everything is so mundane and ordinary and difficult. God's next call for you is already signed and sealed. It may seem small and insignificant. It could just be the commitment to get into the Word and pray in a meaningful way every day. It could be that phone call to encourage another person or that act of kindness that seems little to us, but huge for those we are serving. Maybe it's a call to ask him to help us change our attitudes, our thought life, our behavior, our habits. So the greatest question is, what is my largest desire? What do I want more than anything else? God chooses, uses, and blesses those who most want to follow him, who want to be like Jesus. Can I say with David, I run to the path of your commands because you have set my heart free. The takeaway today is what has God told you to do that you postpone, dismissed, or refused to do? A lot of us have had to stay home during COVID-19. We haven't seen the people we normally see during a typical work or school or even social environment. But, while, but, but what about at home? Has the time we've spent with our families caused us to be more irritable, less loving, or have we used the time to get more into the Word with those we love the most? 
to share with them how God is working in our lives, to help them desire all that God has for them. As a believer, what is God telling you to change about your day-to-day living that would bring you closer to him and make you that blessing that Gideon was to those that you see every day? The challenge today is, will you, first of all, will you get with the Lord? Will you, as, as a believer, will you ask him, Lord, I know that, I, that I've grown a lot since I've, since I've become a Christian. That's true. But I know that you have eons of growth left out there for me. I want to grow. I want to grow like you want me to grow. I want to become more and more like Jesus every day. Please reveal those things in my life that I need to start doing that I'm not doing or change and stop doing. Please reveal those to me and give me the grace and the heart and the spirit to begin living life more and more every day. You know, it's funny because we watch kids grow up and whenever we see those children of ours that are now adults, when they're little, we can imagine what they were like when they were toddlers. I got a picture in my, in my phone that's courtesy of my wife of, of our two youngest uh, grandsons, and they're sitting together. One's almost 10 months old. The other one's almost three, and they're sitting together on one of those little Hot Wheel things. I don't know how the one in the back is sitting up, but he is. But anyway, they're not riding. They're just sitting there getting a picture taken. And as I saw that picture, it reflected on what their father looked like at that age. Life is about growth, not just physical, but Jesus saved us. He died and rose again and saved us for the purpose of growing us spiritually. I'm not supposed to be the same Christian that I was 30 years ago. I'm supposed to be more grown up in the Lord, and that growth pattern doesn't change until God is ready to take me home. So what is God saying to you as a believer today? about that. Maybe you're here this morning, or maybe you're watching online, and you don't know what it means, really, to have that relationship with Jesus Christ. You don't know what it, what it means to have him as your Lord and Savior. And you've been listening, and you know that that's something that you need, and you would like to have it. Well, fortunately, the Bible didn't make it too complicated. It's very easy to understand. Romans 3.23 tells us that the payment for our sins that we commit before a holy God, the payment for that sins is, is eternal death. But you know what? God didn't want that to happen, and so he was willing to give the only sinless person, his own son, to come and live that perfect sinless life to show us for 33 years exactly what he, he intended us to be, and then to give his life unmercifully and undeservedly in a way that would allow his, our sins to be placed on him, the sins of every person that will ever live or has ever lived or that is living now. And all we have to do is ask him to forgive our sins and trust and believe that the word is true when it says that on the third day he arose from the, from the grave. He conquered sin. He beat Satan. He conquered death. And the Bible says that in John three sixteen. God loved the world so much that he gave Jesus that whosoever believes would not die in their sin but have everlasting life. And then all who received him, as many, no matter how many, as many as received him, as many as said those words and said, God, I know I'm a sinner. And I, I want your forgiveness. And I trust that not only did Jesus die and pay, but he rose again so I could have eternal life. As many as received him, to them, he gave the right to become the children of God. Will you bow with me this morning? If you're here and you know that you're saved and you're trying to walk closely with the Lord or maybe it's been a while, you're watching and it, it, it's been a while since you really were close to the Lord, that spirit still lives inside you. That Holy Spirit is still there. That Holy Spirit brings conviction of different kinds to believers and unbelievers. And when we've not been living for the Lord, that Holy Spirit bring convictions to the believer to let them know that they need to, to turn and go back toward the Lord. It even brings conviction to the, to, the, to the committed believer to allow them to understand that God has more for them, more for them. Paul even said, I, I reach for that prize of the high calling. As great a man of God as he was, he knew he hadn't reached the end. 
And so no matter where we are in our walk with God, if we're believers today, God wants us to move to higher levels. And the only thing we can do is surrender more to his call, to his will, to his plan for our lives. We may not even know what that is, but if we're willing to surrender, he will definitely show us. So maybe that's your prayer today. God, help me to go that next step. Help me to surrender more of my will, more of my thoughts, more of my plans, more of my openness to what you have for me. If you're here and you haven't ever received them, now's the time when all you have to do is just say, God, I know that I've sinned. I know that you died and paid for my sins and rose again, and I want you to come into my heart and forgive my sins and give me your gift of eternal life. So I'm going to pause for a minute or so and allow you to get with God without any noise going on. And then we'll close in prayer. today we love you and we praise you for who you are we know father that nothing that we've done deserves your love your grace your mercy your salvation your forgiveness of our sins and your gift of eternal life and we praise you for it today we can't praise you enough really we're looking forward to that day that we go home to be with you, but we're also looking forward to the days that are left on this earth when you can work in our lives. And I know that that old sinful nature is still there, Father, but I pray that you would squelch them, that you would help us to resist Satan at every turn and be used mightily for your glory. I pray for the body of Christ across you today, Father, that you would encourage them in the midst of all that we're, that we're facing, that you would uplift them and make them be able to look forward to that day when we can come again, but even to look forward to today and tomorrow as you work in their lives and to be able to experience that joy that knows no bounds, that peace that passes all understanding, Father, because you are working in their lives and we have committed them to you and we're letting you work. We're not trying to run them ourselves. Father, I pray today most of all for those who may be listening, oh, they might be a member of a church. They might have gone to church some. They might have even attended vacation Bible school or anything else, but they know in their hearts they do not have the peace that comes from knowing you, Father. They know in their hearts they've never prayed to receive you as their Savior. But Father, I pray that not by my words, but by the conviction of your Holy Spirit, Father, that this would be the day. This would be the day when they would reach out to you even on this internet connection. And pray the prayer, Father, ask for forgiveness and, place, and, and pledges and, and, and places their faith and trust in you. I thank you, Father, that as long as we're here, that opportunity still exists. We love you today. We praise you for all things. We look forward to all that, that's going to happen in the days to come. But we give it all to you. We give all the glory to you, Father. We receive none of it of ourselves. And we praise you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>